Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Father, we come before you once again, and we thank you and praise you for who you are. We thank you that you gave us another day, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we are allowed to gather together. Father God, we praise you and we worship you, Lord. We ask you, dear God, that you would just come to this day and meet us at everyone's needs, Lord. You know what everyone is going through, Father God. So I ask you, dear God, just meet their needs, Father God, right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We ask you, dear God, that you, as Pastor Jose comes up to give us your word, Lord, that we will take that part that is for each and every one of us, Lord. And that we not just hear it, but that we will walk in it, Lord. And we praise you and give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. As the communion elements are being passed around, um, this past Thursday, Rich and I went to the movies and we saw the season finale of uh, The Chosen. You guys will probably see it tonight and Tuesday. And um, there's just a small portion that was so profound. Um, and one of, one of the segments of of the, um, the show was when Jesus was feeding the 5,000. Uh, yeah, the 35,000. And it just reminded me of... In terms of communion, in terms to the bread, right? As there were thousands and thousands of people there, they were hungry. And, and Jesus knew they were hungry, you know, but he still kept talking, still kept talking. I can imagine, you know, stomachs are growling. He still kept talking. But he knows, he knows when you're hungry. And he loves when you're hungry for him. Because not only is he the hunger, but he is the food. He knows he knows the kind of hunger you have deep inside your heart for him. Does anybody here hunger for the Lord? Amen. No matter how many years you've been serving him, do you still hunger for him? Like if you just encountered him for the first time, Amen. it's still that hunger. But isn't it great that he fulfills that hunger with his food, his, himself, himself. So as we lift up the bread, Father, we just thank you for your bread, for your body that heals us, that heals our emotions, heals our hurts, heals our minds. How wonderful it is that we would never go hungry with you ever, ever. So it is exciting that as we go into our, our prayer time, you always feed us, and you always fulfill our hunger, our needs. Even when we think that our needs, our needs, our earthly needs are great, but there you come, and you, you fill us up with your presence, with your love. So as we take communion one body and one accord, We just want to say we love you, we thank you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. And in the same way that, as I mentioned, as here's our hunger and here's our food, he's also our thirst and he's also our drink he's our provision redemption and communion with us he loves communion with us as we take this and I really I really ask that you take communion often every day and Jay and I spoke about this uh, a couple of weeks ago about taking communion every day 
so important and it's so fulfilling it's so beautiful to just commune with him and just have a little private time with the lord so father god i thank you for your blood for your redempting blood and i plead the blood over each and every person here open up their eyes to see how important and how beautiful it is to take communion, to commune with you, to plead the blood over their own selves and their own home, that they have access to that. So as we take this together, I pray that you continue blessing us with your presence, with the very presence of Jesus and Holy Spirit. Oh, we love you, Holy Spirit. We love your presence. And so at this very moment, we give you our, our presence. And we give you our attention. We love you. Let's drink together. Ministries NYC. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm going to give you guys some boom formation. If you would like, thank you. Thank you. For those of you that would like to go on our website, it's www.bodyofoneministriesnyc.com. All righty. Corporate prayer is every Tuesday evening at 7:30 p.m. And it's on Zoom, and everyone needs to remember prayer is what? Necessary. Necessary. And now, always, we always need to have prayer to have communication with our Savior. So don't miss out. Also, I just want to um, let you guys know, we are going to start doing an attendance. And in that attendance, I need you guys to do me a big favor, please. And start to use the Space Wix app and register. Whether you're going to be coming in on a Sunday or staying home, we need we have it right there. You can even go on the website and you can do it from the website. The link will and just follow the link, right? The link, press the link, and then it will just follow the instructions. And all you gotta do is put your your name or your email, one of those things, and you get registered. We need to know this information because if we want to get out of here and have a building, we need to have all these things in place. So that's how you guys can also help us out by attendance so that when the person's at the door, whoever the greeter is, will be checking you in individually. So it's a big necessary thing to do. All right? We're good? Amen. Good? Amen. All righty. Even if you're online, to so do the same, please. Um, it gives you the whether you're going to come in in person or you're going to stay online. All right. The next Skills You Outreach is March 3rd. By the way, this one was beautiful. The ministry Amen. was great. It was, it was wonderful. Th praise God. So remember, the next one, bring your kids out, bring your neighbors out, bring your grandchildren out, whatever it is. Skills You Outreach, March 3rd, which will be at, um, on 86th Street, which is at the Salvation Army. Um, it starts at 5 o'clock. So it's, a, it's an amazing time that we have there, and we get to call it pasta night because we all eat pasta right. together and break bread. So that's amazing. That's always a good thing to have. Um, we are very happy to announce that we are going to have some visitors come in on March 12, and it's going to be Freedom Sunday. That's what we are calling it, Freedom Sunday. So we're going to have ministers. I think it's a team of four, right, Jose? It's a team of four that will be coming in, and they're going to be praying for us. They will take the time out after the service to pray for everyone. It's going to be an amazing, blessed weekend. Um, uh, Pastor Frank was the one that helped us put all this together because we've been asking for it, and we just wanted to be in trusted hands because we don't take it lightly for anybody just to walk into these doors so and be on the podium. So. We're so grateful for that, and we can't wait. So mark it on your calendar, March 12th. Um, Sight and Sound is coming up. We're so excited. 
We will be going to see Moses on March 18th, and we are, like, done with the tickets. It's what? How many people are coming now? 54 people. Woo! That's half the church from online, and the ones that come in, that's half of us. There's 104 of us. So 54. That's crazy. Fearless and Boom Camp is March 25th. Put that. <laughs> Jot that down. Remember, register for all of these events on the Space Wix app. Whoever needs help or the invitation code, please come to me after service and I will guide you. Even Jay, he knows how to do it. He's the one that actually set it up, so kudos to Jay. Um, but, yeah, please go onto the app and start using it. We need to use the app. Members classes will start March 22nd and 29th. It'll be on, um, you're going to have this. In person or it's going to be Zoom? Zoom? What's that? Membership? membership. Oh, membership is on Zoom. On okay. Monday night. It'll be on Zoom, and then the membership ceremony will, uh, will determine the day for that because in March we really do have a lot of things happening. Um, Discipleship 101 and 102 is every Sunday starting March 26th. So it's class 101 will be at 7.30 a.m. here and on Zoom, Ooh. and that's till 8.30 and then class 102 will be from 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. here and on Zoom. So you guys, could, whoever wants to come at 7.30 can stay here throughout the whole time. And then, of course, there's soaking at 9.20. It'll start. Even though you're still having a class, I'm still going to have soaking at 9.20. So God bless you guys. We love you guys. Hold on. We have a planned interruption. Stop. <laughs> Normally, you do not interrupt a pastor, but it is my father's oh, 88th my birthday today. Shout out yes. to my dad. Yeah. And it is Pastor Sabrina's birthday as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Love you. Oh, you're not leaving yet. Pastor, um, let her go and sit down. We want to give her a blessing and um, and a prayer. So if you guys can extend your hands and stand up, please. <clears throat> Pastor Jose, can you come over here? And some of the leaders, where's Pastor John? I feel like Miss Universal. Well, I got my crown. There she is. You want to be able to get her crown? Want to crown me, babe? Where's her crown? You got to get her crown. Oh, no, you crown. <laughs> Susan, crown. Susan, come over here. Come on. Where's um where's Ashley and Adolfo? Gaco? Jack? Emily, we'll get another one next week. Where's Jack? No, no, we won't let you. Okay. <laughs> come on guys. Just get go around. Get in, get in, get in. Is it around here? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, Abba Father. We give you all the glory and the praise and honor for this woman of God. Yes, yes. That you gave her this amazing calling. She has truly the heart of a pastor, Lord. Yes, she does. She loves unconditionally and she wants to help everyone, Lord. Fill her with your strength, Lord, especially on the on the days that she is weak. Give her that amazing roadmap as she continues year after year celebrating her birthday, that she finishes the race the way you want her to, and that you will always be by her side, nourishing her, guiding her, comforting her, giving her strength, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus over her, over her children, over her husband, over her home, over her finances, over her health, over her peace, over her church, Lord, that she loves so much. And let all these things just grow in abundancy, Lord. We give you all the glory and honor, and we bless this woman of God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. You know, generally when um, I'm asked to do something in the Sunday service, I wait on the Lord for scripture and, uh, you know, use it for whatever he's putting on my heart. And today I had no scripture. He hasn't given me anything. And, I, you know, the Lord said, um, well, you're doing giving. And he asked me to follow up on what uh, my wife, Pastor Sandra, shared last week. And... Um, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure some of you do. She shared about the uh, health situation that I was in uh, several years ago. And you know, she said all her life, all her Christian life, she has been a tither, a giver. Um, I've, I've lived most of, most of my Christian life the same way, certainly for the last 20, 25 years. It's part of who I am as a Christian. Well, why do I say that? Because we went, she shared with you that we went through a very, very difficult uh, period in, our, in my life and in our marriage. Uh, you know, I, I, had, I had suffered tremendously from uh, diverticulitis and had five surgeries in the course of four years. And actually, I had three surgeries in the course of four days at one point. It was, it was a very, very difficult period. Um, at, that, at one point, I actually said to the Lord, I'm done with this. Just, just take me home. But the Lord had other plans, and that's a, that's a testimony for another time. But, but all, why am I saying this? Because we had, I was out of work. I had, I had never um, in my life gone on any kind of human resources. Uh, I, never. And I, I was forced to, I was forced to, you know, take compensation from the city for being out of work. It was something that was just killing me in my pride because that was something I would never been able to do. But even with that, we exhausted our savings. We exhausted everything. We didn't have a nickel to our name. Our, ch our charge cards were, were gone. But, you know, I speak to my brother. My brother's a pastor out in Las Vegas. And um, I said, I said, I'm going to have to, I've never borrowed money in my life. I said, I'm going to have to borrow money or I'm, I'm going to not gonna be able to pay the mortgage. I said, you know, and I told, I, I said, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my house. And he says to me, I'm believing that the Lord will provide. I'm believing the Lord will provide. And I have to say, my faith wasn't there. All right, my faith definitely wasn't there because I'm looking at, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm looking at what we went through, you know, and you know how we got abused. Now, I'll sidetrack for a second about Pastor Sandra. She never worries about the money. Every time I get anxious about the money. She just like says to me, God will provide, and walks away. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, yeah, I know that, but I still want to, yeah, okay, never mind. Uh, that, that being said, um, but that's really the truth. So getting back to uh, home, uh, one day, you know, I couldn't even go upstairs. You met, most of you have been to my house. I lived on the couch for probably four or five months because I couldn't even go up the stairs. And uh, we got to this point. And one day the bell rings, and um, my boss at the time and another man walked into my house, and they brought in, they brought in a check for two thousand dollars. Now, let me tell you the significance of that. My mortgage payment was eighteen hundred dollars, and we have always tithed. In my mind, you know, we can have this conversation later if you want, but in me, tithing is, is ten percent. I'm not. That's not doctrine here at all. I'm saying the way what God puts on my heart, right? The Bible tells us, you know, give what, give what God puts on your heart because he loves a cheerful giver. That's how we've operated. God not only provided my mortgage payment, he provided the tithe. That's right. right? We have never, we never went without a meal. All our bills got paid. We continued to bless the Lord with our finances, with the first fruit, with the first fruit of our, our labors. And I have to say that um, we've, we've shared, we've reaped the blessing that the Lord promises to those who are faithful to the, his, to the needs that he tells us. Most of you know me. I'm, I'm far from a wealthy man. But Sandra and I do okay. We're, we're okay. Amen. Every bill gets paid. Doesn't mean that I don't get anxious from time to time. And then Sandra comes up and says to me, God's going to take care of it. You know, we all call to be good stewards of our money, right? So it's not like, don't, I'm not saying give frivolously because God will provide. You have to find a balance between stewardship and, right. and whatever your heart is. 
But I want to tell you that God is a God of promises. And he does live up to his word. That's right. His name is Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. He is the God who provides. All right? And I believe with all my heart, you have to depend on his promises. And he will never fail you. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that the things you put on my heart, Lord. And I know you don't put them on my heart, Lord, just for me. You put them on my heart to be shared with, with your people. So I do that today, Lord. Father, I, I ask you, Lord, to just bless bless the giving, Lord. Lord, that, that every person would be at peace in their heart. With peace in their heart. And what they support, how they support this ministry, Lord. For your word says, you love a cheerful giver. Lord, we give to you cheerfully, Lord. And Father, I pray for wisdom and guidance on our pastors and on the leadership of this body of one ministries, of how we use your, your finances, your finances, Lord, to advance your kingdom, to, to increase salvation, Lord God, to, to disciple the, 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 your children, Lord. All of the above, I pray wisdom on our, on our pastors. <coughs> and we give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys are ready for the word? Yes. yes. All right. We're going to read out of the book of Genesis today. I'm going to reference a lot of different scriptures as we go on. Um, identity, discovering who you are and why you are. Um, man, I think one of the biggest problems that we have as a nation today is that we've lost who we are. Um, and we've lost who we are because we're so focused on pleasing everybody else to have them become who they think they should be. Right? And so um, I just want to go back and this is more, I think, I personally think is more of a teaching as opposed to a preaching. Um, but let's read. You guys are ready? Amen. I just want you to keep this in mind. Every 79 seconds, someone's identity is being stolen. Every 79 seconds, there's a person's identity being stolen. And I don't know about you, but when you're grounded in Christ, nobody can steal from you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We ask that you bless this word, O oh God. Let it be an in-season word for those who are insecure in who they are. Let it be a confirmation for those who think they know who they are. Lord, have your way. Have your way in boom. Have your way in our hearts. Father, bless your people. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's about your word. The edification of your body. We thank you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 25, verse 21. We're just going to go to 28 for now. Let me know when you're ready. 21 to 28, all right. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled to get, um, together within her and said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Remember that. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Which is very untraditional, right? Because in the nation of, well, in, in, in Jewish culture, the younger serves the older, right? But here, God is like, this is almost like what you've called unclean. Don't call what I've called clean, right? Unclean. He's saying, now, nah, I'm going to show you what you're going to do, right? The older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. Somebody say twins. twins. I'm a twin, guys, if you guys didn't know. Seriously, with a girl. Her name is Eliana. All right. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called him Esau, his name Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. Just imagine that. Your twin want to hold you back. 
I hope my sister ain't watching this today. <laughs> so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was um, 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he hate, I'm sorry, he ate of his game, of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Then we go on to Esau selling his birthrights. We'll get into that. So there's a plea, right? And clearly, in a moment of desperation, how many of us make pleas? I don't know about you guys, but I know I do all the time. And so what I thought was interesting was really like the firstborn serving the new, right? And um, I think that's something that should come back to the, to the American church, right? Because we get into that custom of the young ones now feeling entitled, right? This is a, this is a generation of entitlement. Yes. There's, there's no more... There's no more, um, we, I guess we're the remnant of taking charge and not depending on other people. And um, so what I thought, you know, was interesting was Jake, um, one, was a tent, one was a tent maker or tent dweller, and the other one was a hunter. And what we got to understand is that when you raise a generation of hunters, you become killers. When you raise a generation of tent makers, you become worshipers. Now, understand that these are two nations which we consider Palestine today, right? Esau is half-brothers with Ishmael. You guys remember Ishmael? Yeah. The two brothers who run the nation of what we would, cons what we would say, not even a nation, but what we would say Palestine today. I'm going ahead of myself, but these two boys are, bo are born of twins. Um, they were clearly fraternal because they were both different. Um, normally identical twins are very similar in a lot of ways. And so I love that they were very um, distinct about that. So anyway, okay. So twins, but not the same, right? That's the first one we spoke about. The second thing I want to talk about is if I had to call it, it would be Chicken Soup for the Soul. All right. You guys remember those books? Yeah. Right? Chicken Soup for the Soul. Genesis 29 and 34. Now, um, and I'll, I'll read this. We'll keep going. 25, verse 39, 34. Now Jacob cooked the stew, and Esau came from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with the same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So during the youth of the twin, twins, they were raised in the same environment, exposed to the same teachings of their father Isaac and their grandfather Abraham. But one day Esau returns for some stew. Now what we got to understand as I was studying is, it was so easy for him to give up his birthright. You know why? because he knew his father was dying. And so the relationship he had with his father was, if my father dies, I'm gonna die. You guys ever feel like that? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what I'll do if this person is not around, right? And so I think sometimes we gotta get out of that mentality, and I'll tell you why. Because when God has called and commissioned you for a job, it's not focused on relationship to somebody else. Amen. And a lot of times what we do is, we create what we would call um, a soul tie. And the soul tie now blinds up from our purpose. That's right. So we're more focused on the soul tie than we are on the purpose of, that God has put on our life. Amen. And I think that that's a, that's a pretty scary place to be in, especially when he's giving you an identity, a position, and a job to fulfill. Um, he sort of agreed, I'm going to die, what, or what is the birthright to me? So... According to Jew Jewish custom, the day on which Esau sold his birthright was the very first day, was the very same day that Abraham died. Think about that. The day he sold his birthright was the day Abraham died. Now, I, I, was, I was stunned when I came across that as I was studying. 
because, you know, I look at you, Pastor John, and I'm like, not that you're going to die, you know, <laughs> but I look at you because you, you know, you, you spoke to me about that revelation God gave you about Noah, right? And when his grandfather died, when Noah's grandfather died, that's when a flood came because he was the last righteous one, right, from his generation. And so I just think that God is so, like, not that I think, I know he's so precise. And when he gives you a plan, and this is why I think that it's important that we take hold of plans that he gives. Because sometimes the plans don't make sense to us. Sometimes it doesn't look like it's supposed to happen. But when God plans something, and there's a purpose in it, I'm sorry, when he plans something, it's because there's a, there's a purpose in it. And I think sometimes, because it doesn't make sense to us, we despise the purpose or we, we allow, we, we take control ourselves and forget that there's a greater purpose than our flesh. So, Abraham's death. At the time, you do the calculation, would mean that the boys were both 15 years old. Scripture says, you know, Scripture talks about if you study it, when Abraham died, the boys were 15. 15 years later, after the, um, after their birth. Now, I think there's something big about being a firstborn, right? Scripture tells us in like six different places, and I'm going to read them real quick. To be a firstborn is to have superior rank. Agree? Yeah. All right. Genesis 49.3 says, Jacob's own firstborn son received, as Jacob put it, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Right? So you get superior rank. The second thing you get as a firstborn, you get a double portion of the father's inheritance. Deuteronomy 21, 17 says that the Israelites acknowledged the son as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he, the father, has, for he is the beginning of strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Number three, you get a priestly office in the kingdom. Numbers 8, verse 17 to 19, says, God declares, for all of the firstborns amongst the children of Israel are mine. I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the children of Israel, and I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from amongst the children of Israel, to do the work of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel. And finally, the Abrahamic birthright promises that his descendants, his descendants would be a source of a blessing for all, Amen. for all nations of the earth. It's Genesis 21, 18. God gave a promise of how he would make a great nation from Isaac. Arise, this is verse 18, arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand for I will make him a great nation. Stolen identity. Third point. What does the story have to do with identity theft? Well, every 79 seconds in America, somebody's identity is stolen. That's amazing to me. So right now, that's it. Three people's identity got stolen. I don't know how long I've been speaking, but imagine how many people's identity got stolen. According to federal, the Federal Trade Commission, last year alone, 11 million Americans were victims of identity theft, with a total of $55 billion being stolen. Most identity theft is perpetrated through computer and or telephone fraud. Yeah. In fact, while I was studying, right, the new tactic is to rig your caller ID so it shows your bank's real contact information, yep. making you vulnerable to share your personal, to steal your identity. There was a, at a Denver, Colorado a few years ago, um, this is on the news, there was a heavy flight delay. They tell everybody to get back online. Now there's one um, the, the airport was so, like, it was, it was crazy, right? This was right before COVID. And um, you have one guy checking in all these people, finding new flights for them. Follow me? Mm -hmm. 
And what happens? This one passenger comes up, slaps his ID and his plane ticket on the table, and says, "I need a, I need a, um, I need a flight. I want first class, and I want top of the line service." And the flight attendant, I mean the the the, the steward or whatever you want to call the clerk, laughed and was like, "I will help you." Right after, please get in line. Right after all these people. So the guy looks at the clerk and says, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? So the clerk picks up the phone on a loudspeaker and says, can somebody please help this man find his identity? Because clearly he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> identity theft is such a traumatic experience that people can't fathom. You guys remember, I think it was a 2007? I was in high school still. When the market crashed, Nelly? Yes. 2007? Yes. 2008. 2008. Graduated high school in 2008. The, way pe the suicide rate in 2008 was double from the two previous years combined. How crazy is that? People lost what they've been working for. And the scary thing about, about identity theft is that no matter what proofs you give a business or a bank, sometimes you don't get everything back. You just got to take the loss. <clears throat> That's the scary part. So imagine someone taking what you've worked so hard for for so many years, and then somebody coming in and taking it. The Bible says the thief comes to steal kill, and destroy. I'm afraid that some of us don't have something for the enemy to steal. Better preach. <laughs> if you have no identity, then you have no destiny. Right. That's right. And some of us think that we have an identity for Satan to steal, but he's looking at us saying, you don't even have an identity. You believe in me more than you believe in the Christ that you serve. And so here we have twins, and I'm not going to say that I'm the good one. <laughs> Kids, don't try this at home. But sometimes we got to be careful of who's around us. Amen. Because, see, and it's not even sometimes. I'm just going to say all the time. Just because they're in ministry with you don't mean that they're not trying to take your identity. That's right. That's right. There's a lot of... There's an identity. God, God created you with a purpose, okay. right? And I didn't, you know, Manny was talking to the kids on Friday, and he told them to hold up their thumb mm -hmm. and to look at it and to look at the lines and the circles. Like that. And Manny's like, what do you see? And he's like, you know, we all have our own. And that came to me because we're here trying to build an identity that's pleasing to everyone else but God. And so we're looking at how people are building their lives. Yesterday I had to repent because one of, one of my closest childhood friends growing up, he's younger than me, came out the military, bought his first house. The thing is like a mansion in Texas. And I, I was so happy for him, but at the same time I'm like, where am I? Why can't I get that? And I felt my heart being jealous for, for a quick second, and God had to remind me, you can't take that to heaven. And I'm not saying it's not a blessing to have a home. But what God has for you does, is not determined based on material. It's determined based on purpose. That's right. See, because what good is a home in the physical for just me and my family when he created this? Amen. Boom, NY City. A home for Bay Ridge. A home for the lost. A home for Sunset Park. And so here I was that I was feeling this in my heart, and I'm like, man, why am I feeling this? Why am I feeling this? And God has said, it's because you still are trying to find your identity in certain areas. Mm -hmm. If you can't identify, then you don't have identity. Amen. Right. If people can't identify you, then you have no identity. 
And so, you know, with all that, you know, we've been speaking about as a church, it's, it's funny because I really want you guys to understand who you are in Christ. But in order for you to understand who you are in Christ, you first have to understand who Christ is. And some of us are jumping from book to book, from preacher to preacher, trying to feed our spirit and we're feeding our flesh. See, because you can listen to the word of God and feed your flesh. Oh, I want... What did what, I say? I forgot. Oh, <laughs> I, I forgot right away. You can feed... Oh, right. You can still listen to the word of God. Thank you, Nelly. And still feed your flesh. Like, we got to really understand and really comprehend what's going on in this word. You got two people that were born out of believers. And yet still one, still one of them had a contrite heart. That's right. His heart, he had it from inside. It says that they wrestled inside. That's right. You look at other translations, it said they were fighting. I'm sure that that's probably like the passion, like, you know, but <laughs> we got to understand that this is still happening today. That's right. America is still fighting with the nation of Palestine. And I'm not saying that, first of all, that's a fight that I always be there. And I'll tell you why, for three reasons. Number one, in order for you, in order for Palestine to take full hold, because they, they want their full birthright that's not even there. That's right. That's really what it is, right? They want the holy land, the whole yeah. thing, and they don't want to share with nobody. But now you got three different type of people, right? You got the Israelis that live there, and then you got the Christian Arabs. So at the end of the day, no matter what, it would never be theirs. But there's a bigger picture here. When will we fight for our birthright? That's right, amen. When will we take hold of our birthright. And here it was. God gave his only begotten son, his firstborn. And that's where we became heirs. We became heirs when he gave us Jesus. He gave us a new identity. We no longer were made I don't, know, I don't want to say not made. We were made in God's image. But we were no longer bound by the sin of our brothers. And I want you to really understand, in order for our identity to be, to be formed and shaped, we have to receive Christ. And when I say receive Christ, I'm talking about live Christ-like. It's not about being up here and getting prayer. It's not about going to every Bible study. It's not about going to Bible college. It's about believing in the very promises in which God has given us. Amen. And some of us are creating this identity based off of what we go through. No wonder it's not grounded. Our identity, again, determines our destiny. You must establish your identity in Christ Jesus and not allow the thief to steal that from you. Amen. Can we look around a room? Can even look 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 at your heart. Do you think you have something for Satan to even steal? Think about that. Just because you live under someone's household and they're Christians don't mean you have a problem. Because when he comes, he's not going to sit there and say, Jolie, what did Rich do for me? Jay, what did Pop do for me? He's going to sit here and say, Chintzy, what did you do for me? Because it's not about everybody else. And I express this to my kids all the time. You went into baptism? Yeah, that's cool. Now you're responsible. Because when God comes, you're held accountable. He ain't going to sit here and say, what did mom and dad do? He's going to sit here and say, what did you do for me? How did you live for me? That's right, amen. TikTok? The clock is ticking. 
we spend more time there. You know, more people since TikTok has come out, the nation, America, has spent more time looking at TikTok than they have national television. Wow. How crazy is that? And you look at other nations, and they can control what's being put out there. So China, you know what their TikTok is putting? How to be how how to be inventors, scientists. They have filters on what to clean out, what not to show their kids. But they've taken that filter away from America. Yeah. They've yeah. given us the what they built That's in right. TikTok, but taken out all the filters that we can control. That's right. Because if you could damage the kids, you could damage the generation. Yeah. But if we could build the kids, yeah. we can build the generation. God don't need you to build the church. That's right. God needs you to build your heart. Amen. Because your heart is what will set you free. And some of us are focused on building a ministry and not building our identity. And when the ministry no longer exists, you put your identity in the ministry and now you don't know who you are. You know what that's called? Old school church. Look at all the churches where they have 90-year-olds still preaching. I don't want to sit here and say God is not calling us. That's not what I want to say. But what I do want to say is a lot of pastors can't let go because they built their identity in ministry. Right, right. And so now when they have to retire or their season is done, they can't let it go because if they let the ministry go, they have no identity. Right. And I wouldn't name a few churches, but... <laughs> When will we take hold of our identity? Our identity is in Christ Jesus. That's our birthright. That's our birthright. That we were made new in his image. That he died on the cross so that we can proclaim that. That we Think about this. When we receive, see, because this is what people want. And I'm going to be honest with you. New generation. Or let's just say the world. I want the blessings of God. But I don't want to follow him. Right. So you want the inheritance of what it means to be a believer. But you don't want to do the things in which require. See, if you are chasing Christ for what you are to inherit, then you're chasing the wrong thing. I tell my parents all the time, don't leave me anything. Don't leave me anything. I don't want anything. What you've taught me has been good enough. And my father, before, you know, my father had a lawsuit, got a house, whatever, bless him. But before that, he says, look, I, I don't have nothing to give you. But what I teach you, that's what you're going to have to take with you. And I say the same thing with Christ. If we don't fully receive Christ and know who Christ is, how is it that we can leave that for our generation? We're sitting here talking about the young generation is lost. The young generation needs to find their identity, but yet we don't even know ours. How does that work? We're a new church. It's okay if we're still learning about Christ. It's okay. We're always going to be learning about him. Because he's outside of time. He's outside of understanding. He's outside of that. But what we need to understand is we can't create something from our understanding without Christ being involved. You guys follow me? Yeah. Yes. 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 I want you guys to... Well, and I, I think I'm going to do another teaching next week on identity because I want to get deeper. I want you to read this story again. And I want you to understand... If you study Abraham, right, a father of many nations, right, and you study um, Esau, Jacob, study their identity. See, what I love about God is that, you know, and we've seen this before, and I don't know who started this quote, but God calls the unqualified for the qualified God. That's right. <laughs> Moses had a speech impediment, right? Like he, he couldn't speak well, but he still had an identity. Mm -hmm. 
And what what and what did what, what did what did God tell Moses? Tell Pharaoh that it's me. That it's me who sent you. See? How many of us got kids? I'm looking at your kid get hit in school, what you say? Tell them your mom said. Tell them I said. Right? Tell your teacher dad said this. Because you're secure who you are. You don't send nobody talking about who you are if you're not secure who you are. That's right, amen. And some of us are trying to talk about God but don't know who he is. We'll sit there, we'll quote a Bible scripture. God is good. He died on the cross for us. He forgives us of our foul sins. But we won't stand firm and say, no, God said he made a woman and a man. We won't stand firm on topics like that. I was quiet now. We won't stand firm on promises. You can sit here and say who I am, but God created me in his image. That's right. We'll sit there and we'll go in depression. And we'll believe these lies. But we won't believe these truths. I end with this statement. And I think I said it earlier this week. I was telling Jolie and Rich. We have to do. And I'll keep saying this over and over. We have to do. The same sin, the same, the same flesh that we walk into sin with has to be the same flesh that we walk into grace with. I'll put it like this. My flesh is what I don't want to say created that sin, but made me sin. You guys follow me? I walked into it with my flesh. That same flesh is what's going to walk you out of it. The only difference is, is now you're powered by the Holy Spirit. You follow? Yes. You want an identity? You have to do something. You don't have to do something to receive it. You have to do something to walk it out. It's called salvation. You walk your salvation out with fear and trembling. There is a doing. Your identity, we weren't created, we're just looking at each other. Come on, kids, cover your ears. There was a doing that took place. Your body, the woman's body, it does something, right? There's a, everything is a moving thing. We have to build. In order for us to build, we have to do. Even before you start building, I went to Pastor John's house a few times. He has a big table. You got a sketch, right? There's a sketch table. A grafting board. You have to, before you could do this stages. So if you don't know who you are, the first thing is to find out who Christ is. See, some of us are sitting here and, and I'm not going, I don't want to look at nobody, but mm-hmm. we sit there and we'll proclaim God's word. We'll proclaim promises. We'll tell everybody else what God has to say for them. And then we walk around with these insecurities. In the very same areas we're trying to tell people to walk out in freedom with. To me, that's an issue. And it's an issue not because we're a perfect church, but because if we're going to be more than a voice in action of God's word, we have to be authentic in all that we do. I'd rather be authentic in four comments than not be authentic in 50. If we can sit here and say we're doers of our word, we're faithful, we give wholeheartedly, we're a family, then let's stick to those four things and be strong in it. Amen. Before we can try to tell people we're a mega church, we're a mega church with half of our leaders struggling. We're a mega church with half of our people giving. And so we look to all these things of what identity has been to success. What the world says, this is what success looks like in a church. 10,000 people. 10,000 people is what church success looks like. But there's more divorce coming out of that church than the church that has 20 people. Right, Chinsy? I agree. Listen. You rather have four solid friends. That's right. Four lions and a thousand sheep. Four lions and a thousand sheep. That's a street sermon. (laughs) (laughs) 
we have to discover why we are. And the only way to get to the why is to find out the who. When we find out who it is that created us, then we'll know who we are. Right? They, you know, they ask married women, what's your maiden name? Not, not, not who you became after you got married. Who, where you come from. Because where you come from plays a big part. Where you come from plays a big part. There's, some of us are here struggling with our identity. And that's okay. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Some of us have an identity and we want to strengthen it. You're in the right place. Amen. Some of us just walking around with fake ID. <laughs> <laughs> You're still in the right place. We're going to fix that. <laughs> you don't even hear that no more, right? No. In my days, everybody had fake IDs. God wants to use each and every one of us. And I know it sounds redundant, but I want you to understand that if we're going to reach a people, we have to be secure in who we are. Because what do we do when we, when we come across other beliefs and we can't even stand firm in our own? Right. You know, there's some, I'm studying right now um, a class of apologetics. And um, I'm studying it because it's a, it's a class where you defend your faith. That's, right. That's what apologetics is, defending of your faith. And so I really want to teach that class because no matter... No matter how long you've been a believer, if you can't defend what you believe, it means That's nothing. Right. And not that we got to defend ourselves, but people are always going to have questions to contradict That's right. That's what right. we believe. And if you can't defend that, That's right. then that's going to be an issue. And if people got you questioning what you believe, then you may be questioning what you believe. Yep. And that's okay because you're in the right place. <laughs> and so, you know, I want you guys to... Buckle up, because this year at Body of One Ministry, we're going to be doing a lot of Bible teaching. Amen. We're going to be doing a lot of Bible teachings, and it's not, it's not for our self-edification of teachers and, and gifts. It's more so that you can grow in the things of the Lord. Churches won't, they hold stuff like this back from you because they're threatened by you. I seen a post the other day that said, some people hold you back because they're threatened by your call. Yep. Some pastors hold leaders down because they're threatened about who they will become over who they are. Because there's an insecurity and there's a, there's a breach in their identity. Amen. And so I want you, if look, we all have different lives. We all come from different places, and I get it. I get it 100%. But we all serve the same God. We all should be standing on, on a firm foundation, no matter where you come from. <laughs> because if we're going to be in one accord, we got to sound the same. We got to believe the same. We got to fight the same. Especially if we all bleed the same. Yeah. There's <laughs> nothing that separates us. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We ask that you would just bless us, oh God that you would strengthen our identity. Lord, that you would take us to a place of being vulnerable and, and honest with who we're not. Show us who we truly are, Lord, so that you can change those things. In fact, show us the identity in which the world has given us. Replace it with who you say that we are, oh God. Father, we give our hearts to you, Lord. We give our lives to you. Father, we don't want to worry about other people's identity. We want to think about our own, Lord. Some of us are walking around praying for people, declaring, greater is he who is in me. Who is that me? We know who is the he, but who's the me? Lord, show us who we are. Expose our hearts. Speak to us, O oh God. Through your scriptures, Lord. Father, I thank you for this, for, for, for this body, O oh Lord, a body of hungry believers wanting to look more like you, wanting to have your identity, not their own, Lord. Father, we thank you. We ask that you would 
bless us, that you would bless our time together, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for my wife, Lord, as we celebrate her today, Lord. Amen. Father, that she was the blessing that exposed who I wasn't. But with that same mouth showed who you were in me. Lord, that you gave her the eyes to see my identity before I even walked in it. Father, so I just thank you for her, Lord. As we celebrate her today, Lord, we thank you, God, for those around who's shaping and molding the identity of body of one ministry, Lord. That it would never be about what church you used to go to or what do you believe, Lord, but it's about who you believe. That our identity, we don't even have to speak about who we believe, that our love, as your word says, you would know them by their fruits, that our fruits will show your identity, Lord. Father, we ask, oh God, bless the food, bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.